Hi, everyone. Well, in case you haven't noticed, I haven't been done any interviews for about a week and a half. That's because I was recovering from attack by a speed bump. Yes, folks, I was attacked by a speed bump. This here is not a, a booger. It's where I got hurt. <laughs> anyway, I just want to get that cleared up, okay? So my first guest uh, since that little hiatus is um, an actor, a director, a, a writer, and I think a heck of a lot more. Time to get to know him. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Murray Duncan. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very, very nice to be here, Nancy. It's nice to meet you too, for sure. Now, you're, are you in New York? Right now I'm in Los Angeles. I've, oh. I've lived in New York and Vancouver, you know, the typical actor stuff. And you were born in Manitoba, I believe, right? I was, I was my dad was in the Air Force and I was born um, in Port de la Prairie, Manitoba and then moved to Ottawa before I was a year old. And I actually went back to Portage on a specific uh, birthday to sort of see what it was about because I had no idea. And I'm really glad I did that. It was, it was wonderful to see what was happening there. Right. So how did you go from, from being in, in Manitoba and moving around uh, to being an actor and a, a writer and now in Los Angeles? Yeah. Um, uh, point form is, um, you know, I remember back in like, I think it was eighth grade or ninth grade, a, um, a teacher brought us to see the film Romeo and Juliet. Um, and it was the, the one that the film that was shot in 1968. And I fell in love with Olivia Hussey, the actress. I was like, oh, my goodness, this is interesting. And um, uh, but but really, then I did some um, in high school, some someone put together this group to go and do uh, native Aboriginal stories at the museum. So we went there on the weekend and we did it for these kids. And I really, really loved the connection between them and the energy that was happening. And you're relaying these stories and just, they were just so mesmerized. That's, that's one of the things that really got me hooked into it. And then fortunately I had a great theater arts teacher in Kingston, Ontario, where I also lived, uh, Gordon Love, who I'm still in touch with, who really, really sort of gave me something and that, that propelled me forward. Right, very good. Uh, so that started your acting career, but what about the directing? Um, I just always, I, I would, um, I've also been a teacher, which is similar to directing. And I, I've just always been able to help actors improve and be better than sometimes they think they can be. And I, um, I, I started it through teaching and then I, I thought, well, one, a great way for these students to have the full experience is to do a play. Mm. And, and I told them that, and then they looked at me and I realized, oh, I just committed myself to directing them in a play. And I did that when I was working in Vancouver, when I was working on the Stargate production, um, cause I would teach on the side. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really cool because the Stargate people are like a family. And I, during a break, I went to uh, the break room to get coffee, which was basically a huge storage area. And I saw these set pieces that look like steel girders that hold up subway platforms. And I thought, wow, that would be great for my set. So I went to the producer and I said, could I? And he said, I'll get back to you in 20 minutes. And he came back and said, yes, you can take the four that you need. And I said, I can compensate for them. And he said, no, just bring them back in the condition. So th everything was just kind of humming along. We did this wonderful show about this New York uh, city life. So that kind of got me into it. And then I moved into someone said, you know, you're really great at directing actors. You should direct film. But I, I knew everything about television, but I didn't, I mean, sorry about theater, but I didn't know about right. on camera stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was living in New York during 9-11. And I decided that since everything had gotten very quiet, I went to NYU and did a three month full time film intensive, which was brilliant. So I'm trying to be quick here, but basically I ended up um, uh, creating an animated, the pilot for an animated series that taught written Chinese characters. And that kind of took me around the world to China a number of times and all these different places. So that's a quick overview. <laughs> you Listen, you can take as much time as you want. If, if you run out of time, you can always come back on the show. Oh, that'd be good. That'd be good. Yeah. yeah so there's no rush, you know, and there's no set time limit unless you have a schedule to get to, you know, that that changes everything, right? I see. I see. Good. So you directed Memorial Day. Now tell me about that. Well, um, I'm going to give you the backstory. When I went to theater school in New York City, um, uh, one of the teachers in the last, it's a two year program. And in the last few weeks, he said, you know, if you ever need some monologue material, there's this brilliant book called Everything We Had 
an oral history of the Vietnam War by 33 soldiers who fought it. Mm -hmm. And so I picked it up and I loved it. There was a, there's one in there that I did. It was actually a nurse, but I changed it to a male nurse. And um, uh, then a couple of weeks out of school, one of my classmates said, hey, this guy's teaching this class and you can do whatever you want. You scene, monologue, whatever. And I said, oh, okay, I'll go. So I go to it and he says, so what are you gonna do for us? And I tell him about this piece I just told you about. And he kind of had this look on his face, you know, and um, the neighborhood playhouse is a very heavy process in reading people's behavior and hearing how they say things, not just what they say. And I looked at him and I said, what? And he goes, oh no, nothing, nothing. And I got up to do it and I looked at him again and I said, well, there is something. And he said, well, I have a piece in that book. And I was like, and I said, you know, I, I can't do this in front of you. I, you know, he, and he said the coolest thing. He said, you know, when I was over there, I was pretty close to your age, a little bit younger. But now I'm in my 40s and I, I can't relay these stories anymore. It has to be from somebody your age to carry the message. I couldn't do it in front of him as well, but, I, but still, that was cool. So for some reason, he and I became friends and... Uh, I would send him, you know, Christmas cards and stuff. And I ended up, um, you know, going to Vancouver, all that stuff. And I got back to New York at one point. I was subletting a play, his place because he and his wife had moved to uh, Pennsylvania. And he would come in once in a while for auditions. He was a member of the actor's studio. And so um, I coached him on a couple of auditions and uh then i had moved to la he moved to la the actor's studio encouraged him to write a play about his experience with ptsd mm -hmm. and then in the end he asked me to direct it and so i directed it here in los angeles so these crisscrosses you know people say when a butterfly flaps its wings i mean that one teacher making that suggestion mm -hmm. i've had a lot of great influences from teachers mm -hmm. making that one suggestion of the book has led me to so many experiences and like directing and uh, Brian, his name is Brian Dellett. Um, so the so I directed the theater production and, and then he gave me a hard drive full of hundreds and hundreds of hours of footage and he said, can you create this documentary from this footage? And it was, you know, 15 years like him going over to Vietnam, mm -hmm. then working on it in the actor's studio, then him producing or actually putting it on in Vietnam in front of the former enemy. So it's a pretty interesting story. And then the theater production here. So I'm actually in post-production for that, just trying to um, okay. get some additional photographs and clean up the audio and the video. So hopefully we'll get that out to festivals soon. Yeah. Wow. It, isn't it amazing? I mean, the coincidence or, you know, some people say there's no coincidence. Everything is meant to be, is whatever. But I just, I just love that, right? What about writing now? You're also a writer. Well, I don't focus a lot of time. I'm trying to, from my time in, in New York during 9-11, um, I didn't have a television yet because I was subletting. I didn't have my furniture yet. So mm. I woke up to the siren, sounds of sirens and everything, and I went outside to see what was going on. And I, I watched one of the buildings go down. And all of the stuff that was going on on the street was incredible because um, I, was, I was living one kilometer from the site, which is pretty close in New York. And... Yeah. Uh, the people were coming up 7th Avenue right near where I lived and, and there were so many moving experiences I had and so I, I started and during that time to keep my sanity I wrote things down I just wrote it all out I was journaling and so I've started finally going back to that material and, and uh, uh, doing it for uh, writing groups to sort of see if I can find I have all these vignettes but I don't know what the o overall story is oh, yeah. so that's one thing I'm working on. And my younger brother, Ken, is a very prominent animator and now has his own uh, company here in L.A. And he um, started it 11 years ago, and I um, knew a little bit about business plans, so I made the business plan for him. And I realized what you want to do is you want to have your own product, because otherwise you're just doing work for hire for other people. Mm -hmm. So I suggested he do this thing about teaching Chinese uh, written characters, because I had been in Toronto and I heard on the news how China is going to move into the center of economic power. This is like 19 uh, or sorry, 2006. Right. And so um, he was interested. So my um, in, during my three-month class at NYU, I met a Korean woman, and I told her I want to do something mystical and fantastic, and for children and uh, educational. I said it'd be good if it somehow worked for the people in China, 
And she came back a week later and she said, well, the written Chinese characters are pictographic, which means they look like what they represent. Mm -hmm. And that was fantastic for animation. So we create, it took us a couple of years, but we created the uh, pilot for it. Hi, my brother ended up turning it down because he had a film come in to work on, which is better. So um, we, uh, Min Young, my Korean uh, associate, uh, we found another company and we created it. And so that was that was part of the writing process for me as well. I don't focus and I mean, I don't focus enough time on writing. There was a, a man I met at a cafe, a group of friends, and he said, oh, you, you guys, you know, you start out as actors and you're doing this and that, and you all end up being writers and directors or something. And I said, well, the point is, I think as you get older, you start to think of the bigger picture of life and you want to relay that message. And as the actor, you're the paint, but as the writer, you're the painter. Nice. So uh, I, I, I do a little bit of everything, basically. You know? Very good. <laughs> Very good. But you also were a lecturer, right? At uh, what is it, DreamWorks Animation? Yes. Well, I, I um, here in L.A., I was an adjunct pro uh, professor, a part time professor teaching acting and directing to animators at the California Institute of the Arts, which is always in competition with Sheridan in Toronto for who's better. But they're the feeder schools for Disney, DreamWorks and all those places. And so they they probably knew of me from my students who were graduating. So they asked me to come in and lecture and I did. Uh, it was very cool. I did. A, they do these lunchtime one hour lectures and uh, I did three day. They have you do three days in a row and they wanted to know about the Meisner acting technique, uh, which I what I studied in New York. And so I went in and did that and I brought uh, six students from Cal Arts and I brought six acting students. Now, animation students don't want to get up on their feet and do acting improv usually. But I get them up on the first day and, you know, <laughs> we, we work it out and I give them slideshows so they can sit and watch stuff as well. So at the end of these three days, I said, could all of the animators please put up their hands? And literally people gasped because they didn't think that there were any animators among this group because they were so good and so out there with their work. But there was um, what's what's funny is they um, when anybody comes and lectures on animation on acting at an animation studio, most of the people sit at least 10 rows back and further. They don't want to be selected <laughs> to come up and be demonstrating. And I don't do that. I think that's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so, and they even told me, they said, please don't, da, da, da. I said, don't worry, I never do that. But there was one man sitting in the second row, right in the middle. And I was like, and all three days, it was very peculiar. After the first day, he came up to me and he said, oh, my name is John Stevenson. I was the director of Kung Fu Panda. Would you all like to come and have lunch with me? So oh. we all had lunch and he did that every day. So, you know, by the end of it, I'm able to call him, you know, John. And so I said, um, uh, uh, why, why are you so curious to talk to us? He said, well, I'm about to direct a film, a live action film, and I'd, I'd like to know more about acting. So I actually created a two day seminar just for him and I brought actors in and I took actors and I had I had uh, pairs, but I had I double cast a, a particular scene and I did two scenes. So he had different actors to work with on the same scene so he could see how a different actor responds differently. Mm -hmm. So so there was that was that was a pretty wonderful experience. He's a he's a wonderful man and extremely talented. Right. How cool. I love all of this stuff. Mm. Um, now, you also, you're a manager at uh, Coyote. I'm saying that right? Yeah. Coyote, yeah. Coyote Films? Yeah, in Vancouver. I um, be, So with the 9-11 thing, as we were working on the animation, um, in, in New York, the waiter's job was replaced by working in the investment bank computer departments, creating their pitch books. You're given all this scribble and you kind of make it look good and they have these templates. So that was a great job. Um, paid well, you could, you know, they go 24 hours a day. So I'd work from uh, eight, eight or sorry, 4 p.m. to midnight. And um, uh, I lost my quite, what was your question again on? <laughs> uh, you were a manager at the- Oh, Network. yes, yes, yes. So with 9-11 happening, they started cutting back staff. Okay. And I was in the last cut. And then once that happened, I'm like, what am I going to do? I got to make some cash. So a friend of mine said, hey, I can, I, got, I know a guy in uh, Vancouver. He runs a locations department. 
So I went there and did that for one year and I started out as a PA, which was a great experience. And I also wanted to know how they hired directors because I had just done the uh, NYU thing. So um, uh, then I, I, within four months, I was a production manager and, and I was running, you know, kind of running the show. And they were commercial productions, by the way, uh, outside, you know, location stuff. So in Vancouver is great because you've got rivers, lakes, oceans, you've got snow up in the mountains, you've got cobblestone streets in Old Town. So um, uh, that was a fantastic experience to really, really appreciate what, what goes on on the set. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did that exactly for one year and then my lease expired. And I thought, do I I've hit the ceiling? I don't want this to be my career. So I got back to L.A. This time I moved to L.A. And then uh, Min Young came to L.A. because that's the place to get animation done. And then we did. So um, but I loved the experience in Vancouver. I mean, it was a little tough. You're in the rain, you're in the snow, you know, your feet are getting wet. But watching the crews work helped me uh, as an actor as well. Yeah, for sure. I just want to get back to the teaching for a second, because um, years ago, I took some uh, uh, classes from two different uh, acting teachers, and it sure makes a difference when you have a, a good teacher, you know, because the first mm-hmm. one wanted to strip us down and then rebuild us, whereas the second one wanted to work with who we were. And what a difference that makes to yes. be allowed, to, and as I'm sure you know, to be to be allowed to be you. But to yes. bring whatever, I mean, I, I never made it as an actor. Or it just wasn't my thing, really. But I just wanted to make that observation. So I, I'm sure a lot of um, actors would appreciate you having been an actor, doing the teaching, and then getting into the directing. It, it all seems to make sense to me hmm. that, that you do that and that you do it well, you know? Hmm. So... Um... You're right about teachers and there's a lot of hocus pocus out there and there's a lot of people trying to make money off of actors and they sell a really good sell, but it's a little bit, they're not really giving anything. And my number one focus is making sure that the student is getting something out of it. And I teach the Meisner technique exactly how he taught it. Um, I was very fortunate in that he had retired. And then I, when I went to go there, he came out of retirement because he was bored and he literally interviewed me and blah, blah, blah. So I taught exactly, I teach exactly what he taught. Mm -hmm. And it's a stepping process and it's very, very practical when you come to actually work, you know, Mm -hmm. it's not this thing of like, oh, I have to go home and meditate on how I feel. And, (laughs) you know, uh, it's, and there's a lot of processes where you're looking inward at yourself, whereas with the Meisner stuff, I'm looking out at you and you're helping give me my performance because when it, I don't know what you're going to do. And so it's very alive that, you know, there's there's much more to it than that. But making sure that the student is comfortable is, is absolutely crucial. I went to teach for some guy here in L.A. who had a, he had his own studio and he claimed to be teaching Meisner and. So he came into my class on the third day, which is, you know, two classes a week. It was the third class. I you're barely scratching any kind of surface. And he started teaching and he started he got some of the girls crying and they were all like when he left, they're like, wow. And I'm like, that has nothing to do with acting. That's just manipulation. And now, you know, as an actor, you have to be able to bring that forward yourself, not be whipped into it. And I just so I called the playhouse. and I said, you know, have you ever heard of this person and they were like never studied here because he claimed he had and so i quit i was just like no i'm not going to be part of this i think it's a very sensitive thing and and to the actors out there i think young people wanting to act it's critical you know your experience with a teacher um it could turn you off and Mm -hmm. hurt you that wouldn't be good or you want you want to be armed when you go out to be to be able to get the best work I was in, um, uh, I'll give you a quick story. So uh, I was working in Ottawa for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, as a, you know, file clerk, you know, and everybody in Ottawa works in the government. Right. And um, and then uh, I thought, you know, this is kind of sexy work. Maybe I'll become a Mountie. So I went and I thought I don't have much credentials. So I joined the Governor General's Foot Guard and I was elected top recruit and uh, they wanted me to join the regular force as a as a marksman. And then a touring production of a chorus line came through Ottawa at the National Arts Center. So I went to see it and I was like, oh my God, 
what am I doing? I got to go do that. You know, I got to, that's what I really want to do. I'd already been doing musicals. And plus the Mounties interviewed my, my uh, girlfriend's father. And he had, my, her brother came to me and said, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but dad was interviewed and he told them he thought you really wanted to be an actor. <laughs> and I was like, in, in a backhanded way, it gave me this permission because I thought a person can think about this as a job. And so my mom says to me, you know, uh, Robert, you know, you're at that age, you have a job, you might want to consider getting your own place. And I was shocked, you know, it's like that stage where you have to try to grow up and, and thank gosh she said that because it's it triggered a whole set of circumstances that changed my life. I'm, I moved to Toronto, I started acting and in, my point is in one of the auditions, um, this director, it was for a dramatic play uh, by O'Neill called Long Day's Journey Into Night, very heavy. And he said, you know, you have a lot of energy and a lot of passion, but you need training. Mm -hmm. And then I got cast at the Red Barn Theater north of Toronto, Lake Simcoe, which is unfortunately burned down now, I understand. Mm -hmm. And um, there were two famous actors. I, I was doing two shows. There was um, Tom Kneebone was in Cabaret and William Needles was in, in uh, Dracula and I was playing Harker. So I asked Mr. Needles, I said, Mr. Needles, where do I get training? And he said, if you want to work in Canada and the United States, go study in the U.S. And understand in the late 70s, there wasn't a lot of stuff going on in Toronto in terms of acting schools. Right. And then he said, if you want to go to uh, if you want to study, if you want to work in Canada and England, go study in England. Mm. So I thought, hmm. So I I did both. I, I auditioned for RADA and I auditioned for the Playhouse. And um, uh, I, I got into the Playhouse, uh, Rada, uh, the short story is at the end of my, I did a, I swear I did a great Hamlet audition. And at the end he said, tell me, Mr. Duncan, if you don't get into the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, what will you do? And I was very naive. I said, well, I'm going to go back to my, you know, my government job. And he meant more long term, but I didn't get that. And so on the way out, I asked the secretary, I said, so if we're not going to get in, I mean, if we're, if, how long does it take before we hear? She said, if you're not going to get in and they'll, they'll, and they know that already, they'll, you'll get a letter within a week. But if they're considering you, because they're now about to go over to England to, to audition there, mm -hmm. you'll get a letter in about four to six weeks. I got a letter in four to six weeks in like seven weeks. And I think it was the answer. I was like, that wasn't what I meant, you know, <laughs> but anyway, so um, anyway, I went to the neighborhood playhouse, but it was a very good place to be. There was a lot of nurturing. And I think that's really critical. I think for an actor, I guess the bottom line is ask a lot of questions yeah. of, of other actors, of professional actors, of other students. Cause when you're in one, you think this is great, but you don't have anything to compare it to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good point. That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, now you have a, a website that people can go to, right? Well, I use um, I use IMDb, uh, which is the you know everybody's listed there. Um, so okay. a lot of my stuff is I don't have my own personal website, but people. But can I, and, then I, all, and then all my stuff is on Facebook, right. which I think I might have put in the address to my email to you. But if not, I'll send that to you. Okay, that's great. Well, I have a I have the yeah I have the www IMDB one. Yes. yes. Here. And I will put that when I, once I'm doing the rendering after that, I'll, I'll include that so people can look at it and can find you if they want to find you or hopefully they will. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. I'd love to hear from people. There's yeah. a lot of, uh, a lot of Stargate conventions coming up, so it's keeping us pretty busy. So uh, okay. I love, I love meeting people and talking to them about acting. Very good. Yeah. Well, I like, doing it that's why i do this because <laughs> i love meeting, meeting people and find out why they do what they do it's also I, I, well i think we're going to just end it here um but i'm going to have you back on but uh, just stay tuned for just stay on camera for a bit while i say goodbye to everybody i right. hope you enjoyed listening to and learning more about rob duncan um for me it's really awesome you know how people how I even got his name, it's quite kind of interesting. It just came up on Facebook as a suggestion. So I contacted him, invited him on the show, and here he is. And so it's wonderful for me. And I appreciate you, all of you watching the show. And I hope you continue to do so. And you know the deal. Like, share, and um, subscribe is really nice. Okay, so take care, everybody, and peace out. A sense of community. Till the wax a place to be, a sense of community where you're free. Rolling through the mountains.
mountains rolling through the valley rolling through paradise with me it's multicultural you're sure to see it all Chilliwack's the place to be you'll see come party in the park go dancing after dark Chilliwack's the place to be you'll see